Would you uh, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, the never-ending chapter. 1 Peter chapter 3. So today, after we read a little bit and talk a little bit, we're going to talk about angels and demons. Um, I'm not an expert. However, I've been studying this topic for over 25 years in depth, but I'm not an expert, nor is anybody. And this is not something that we want to be experts at, right? I know everything about demons. Well, that just means that you are one. So please, uh, we study this stuff because it's in our, in our Bibles, and it's important for us to know, otherwise God wouldn't have put it here. But we don't build doctrine around this. We don't live our lives by this. These are facts. And God gives us so little in Scripture about it because it really doesn't matter. And I'm going to say this verse over and over and over again today and for the rest of my life. But know this, that he who is in you, who's that? Is greater than he who's that? That's in the world. That is a fact that will always remain. Jesus in you is greater. We don't have to focus on anything that Satan does. We know his wiles, we know his tactics, we know what he does. So what? But we're still going to dig into this. So put on your seatbelts. And uh, you're like, there's seatbelts here? Yeah. And uh, we're going to uh, we're going to look at this. But first, we're going to start off in verse 13. So. Having made your way there, let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you do in our lives, Lord. Lord, I ask a blessing on this uh, day. I ask a blessing on this teaching, Lord. Uh, Help me to rightly divide the word, Lord, to bless you and to uh, teach this clearly. Lord, bless your people. Bless our fellowship today, Lord. Bless the breaking of a bread, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 13, we went here last week. It says, and who is he, lowercase h, who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? And what is good? Jesus Christ is good. If you become a follower of Jesus Christ and do the things that he commands you to do, who's going to harm you? Who can possibly touch you? Your standing is in Jesus Christ. And maybe you hear this morning go, well, you know, I'm not a really good Christian. It doesn't tell me that That's a qualifier. It says to follow that which is good. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and you're following what is good, well, how do I know what's good? Well, he wrote it down for you. He put it in a book that we would know. What are the things that are good? How do I discern those things? He makes it really, really easy. He says if you're a follower of these things, who's going to harm you? In other words, who is going to take your eternal life? Satan may mess with you. You may have a bad time. They may arrest you for being a Christian. And this life, this life is a vapor, gang. A vapor. Life flies by. Flies by. Ask anybody over the age of 65, you go, are you kidding me? They say that men at 45 years old, that's a midlife crisis. Midlife, that means living to 90. I don't have a chance. My midlife was somewhere around 30. Oh, life, man, this life is a vapor. But who's going to harm you? Who's going to harm you? They take your life and? They execute you and? You, You can't harm me. Because as soon as my eyes reopen, I look into the face of my, my Savior, the one that I love the one that took the pain and the punishment for me. I see him. Glorified body, glorified mind, see things the way he sees them. And I, Lord, I've heard and I've read so much about you. You've been with me all these days and now I stand in your presence. But Lord, you've been here all along. Listen, when when our eyes are open, we're going to be shocked to find 
He's always been there. Ever since we said I do to him, he's always been there. He's never left us. It's us that we get caught up in, in this world that we don't stop and realize he's here. He's here. And, and listen, it happened so, so naturally. I was sitting out on my deck last night. I see my son. He's over there cooking on the grill, and I'm just sitting there quietly. I'm listening to some instrumental worship music. And man, my eyes started to well up with tears. Why? The Lord Jesus Christ showed up. I don't know why. But he, he was never gone. I just quieted my life enough as I'm looking around at the trees and the sky and the clouds moving past, and I realize the Lord is here, never leaving me, never forsaking me. And the same is true for you. You know, I don't feel that. Quiet the noise, and you might. Stop the noise around you, and you just might understand, wow, God, you really are with me. Doesn't mean bad things can't happen. But we have his peace because we sense his presence. And what he's telling us here is, is but even if you should suffer for righteousness, oh, uh, you're blessed. But I'm suffering. Yeah, but you're blessed. And don't be afraid of their threats nor be troubled. And listen, we're living in a day where the threats are going to come more and more. You will be threatened. They'll go after you because of the, your Second Amendment rights. They'll go after you for your First Amendment rights. They'll go after you because you stand against abortion. They'll go after you for everything you stand for, including the Word of God. That's not happened yet. But believe me, if we stay here long enough, we're going to see it. We're going to experience it. Are you ready to stand? That's the question. Will you, will you cower? Will you bow down when the pressure gets too hot? Those are the questions that you really have to ask to know where's your standing in Christ? How much of Jesus do you really want? He says, but listen, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Sanctify? Why does he tell us that? Because Moses, his own Moses didn't do it. Moses, you remember, with the children there in the wilderness, Moses was frustrated with them. God told him, hey, go up there, address the people. And what did Moses do? He got ahead of God. And he took that rod, that rod of Aaron, and he struck the rock, and water came out again. And the Lord grabbed Moses and said, hey, Mo, what the heck are you doing? Why, why'd you strike the rock? I'm not angry with the people. You are. You misrepresented me. You didn't sanctify me to the people. Dads, listen up. This is what we're supposed to do for our kids. We're to sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ to our children. In other words, he's set apart. He's special. When we pray, we pray. Man, you bless your mom, you bless your dad by greeting them, praying for them. In the morning when you rise, go and greet your mom, go and greet your dad if they're home. We sanctify the Lord that way. God is, is special. There's an anointing there, and there's an anointing that falls on the family as well. And here he says, listen, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. Always be ready. When somebody says to you, why are you joy-filled? I know you've got problems. I know your body hurts. Why, do, why are you smiling? Why are you talking about Jesus? Always be ready to give a defense. Why? Because, man, this pain that I go through in my body, this is temporary. I'm going to be with the Lord forever because of what he did. Do you know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? That whosoever, including you, believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Always be ready to give a defense. In fact, you know, I, I spoke this to my, my family yesterday. I don't even know who was there, but I spoke this yesterday. I said, you know, the real calling in our lives 
is to be ambassadors, to be a light everywhere we go. So that when we go into the supermarket, you know, they, they ask that question, hey, did you find everything you were looking for today? You know, I did. I did. In fact, you guys sell something in this store that you don't even know that you had. What's that? Salvation. It's given away for free. Do you know Jesus Christ? Take every opportunity you can to share the light. Now, for some of you, that makes you uncomfortable. But listen, pray for boldness that God would give you that. You know, I told my kids yesterday, you know, I stopped doing that. I got so busy about stuff, you know. I have to run into the store. I, I got to go grab this. I go grab this and I go back out. How about taking a couple extra seconds and the person that helped you out with this and the cashier, listen, for those of you that are cashiers, I'm sorry, but a cashier, you have an incredible opportunity. What are they going to do, run away as they're checking you out? Man, you know Jesus loves you. Yeah, hey, this milk is mine. You know that he, he gave us the land flowing with milk. And honey, this honey's mine too. Do you know that he loves you, that he knows care? He's, he's thinking about you right now. Do you have a relationship with him? You can have a relationship with him. He can live within you. That's his word. That's his promise. And just turn around. They'll have a little Bible or something somewhere. Here, put this on there too. And then just before you leave, give it to them and say, hey, it's a gift. Make an impact. Why? Because our lives are a vapor. Because it's going fast. And we have very little time to make a massive, massive, massive impact. Very little time, but we can because we have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Some of us? Some of us? All right. Give a defense to everyone who asks the reason, the hope that's in you. With meekness and in fear. Listen, having a good conscience, and when they defame you as evildoers, and they will, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. And listen, and they will be. For it, listen, is better. If, if it is the will of God that you suffer for doing good than doing evil. Listen, it might be the will of God that you suffer a little bit. You know, I'm coming through a season of suffering. I get it. But it didn't crush me. It didn't kill me. I, I honestly didn't think I'd, even through this little one here going through, I thought I'd be with the Lord. I, in, in a sick sense, I was almost looking forward to it. I said, man, this one might take me out, you know? The pneumonia kills people all the time. And I said, what if this one takes me out? I said, I'm going to see the Lord. And I didn't even have any strength to, like, be happy about it. I just went to sleep. And I slept, and I slept, and I slept. And every time I woke up, I went, still here. <laughs> but it, it, it's, isn't it better that if we suffer for God's will? Because there's a blessing attached that we press on, that we, that we march on. And listen, look, there's somebody watching from home right now, and you're in a season of depression, and you don't know where to turn, and you feel forsaken. And I'm telling you right now, listen, God has not forsaken you. God loves you. God has a plan through all of this. But you need to rise up. Understand who you are to Christ. And overcome. And overcome. Sorry. The Lord interrupted this message to bring another message. All right. My favorite part. Verse 18, and if this is your first Sunday here, I apologize. We normally don't teach these kind of things, but I don't have a choice. So uh, hang in there and check us out next week. <laughs> Listen, now, now Peter, I don't, I don't know what Peter does here. Peter is trying to bring examples, right? He's told us about being a good employee. He's told us about being a good husband. He's told us about being a good wife. He's bringing all of these illustrations of submission, and they're all good. But now all of a sudden, like, I don't know, man. I know he's a fisher of men, but he is casting far for this one. And when I see Peter, I'm going to say, yo, dude, 
What gives? You made fun of Paul because you said Paul teaches some things that are hard to understand. And then you come out with this doozy. And it is a doozy. And I'm just going to read through it and then we'll come back. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when the once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which is now which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of the God, at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been, having been made subject to him. And I'm glad that's perfectly clear to all of us. <laughs> now listen, there are books that are written about these four verses. Volumes. In my opinion, there are two books written. If you want to look into some of the things that we're going to teach about today, there are two books that have been written in history that I think are, 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 pretty, are pretty dead on. I don't say I agree with 100% of it, but I agree with a great percentage of it. Um, the rest that I have read, and it's probably about 12 in total, were absolute trash. But these are some of the more popular writers today. And if angels and demons get your fancy, you probably have read one or two of those books, which has really skewed your understanding. The biggest problem is some of your former pastors also read those books, and they taught it like it was theology. That's a problem. It's a major, major problem. We stick to the Word of God, and... And today I'm going to go outside of the Word of God, which I never do, but we're going to talk about the book of Enoch a little bit. It's not a canonized book in our Gospels, in our, in our Bible, but it doesn't mean that it's not a good point of reference. All the ancient rabbis read it, all the ancient uh, people on the earth all understood it uh, before the 5th century. It was common reading it did not make the cut into the Bibles, into our Bibles. So please understand that. Um, we'll put this in for the sake of the tape. The tape. We don't even have tape. Why do I keep saying tape? You know what I'm saying. Two books. The Doctrine of Endless Punishment. And we'll put that up here. It's by William Shedd. It is now available on Amazon if you choose to read it. Um, I know it sounds like something of misery. It's not. It's actually a pretty quick read, and it's good. And the next one is Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology by John Fleming. Now, this book was written originally in the 1840s, and it's been out of circulation for years and years and years. It has now currently been put back into circulation. I have one of the original copies. I have one of these copies. Um, and this one does a really good job. If you're into Greek mythology, you want to know where it came from, this book will hit it right on the head. So, um, you're like, oh yeah, I like Greek mythology. Well, then you like demonic beings, because that's what Greek mythology is all about. Now, let's go back. And it looks like I'm going to be doing this again next week, I think, uh, unless we stay. For Christ also suffered once, once for sin, What's the meaning behind that? That means if you go on sinning in your life, telling people you're a Christian, acting like a Christian, but you keep going on sinning, 
understand that there is nothing else that can be done for you. Jesus Christ died once. Amen? Once. Well, what do I do? I went on sinning. Stop. Drop. Repent. Start over again. Really? That's it? That's it. That's it. And, and bring your pastor a hot fudge Sunday. Anyway, <laughs> that might not be accurate theology. I don't know. He suffered once for sins. Listen, the just and the justifier, right? For the unjust. And the word there for the unjust is in the plural sense. The unjust ones. That means all of us. Jesus died once, the just. The only one that was. And he justified us. That he might bring us to God. And that word might in the Greek is not really the word might in the English. It's not might, it means it is, it will be. He's bringing us to Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? He's bringing us, Jesus Christ is bringing us to the Father. You know, it's like we see the Lord and he presents us before the Father. And this one's mine. Dad, this one followed me. This one lost their life. This one gave everything. This one was ostracized and hated because of me, Dad. But they loved me and they didn't back down. They served other people, Dad, because of me. Father, I present you your son. And then just put your name there. That's what Jesus says that he does. I present you your daughter. That's how beautiful, man. How beautiful. I don't know what we're going to be like on that day. You know, and it's like, we're going to be like jelly, man. We're just going to melt before God. I don't even know. You know, I live every life thinking, man, it might be today that I see him. It might be today. I've got, I've, let me say, I've got a passion to see my Savior like I can't even describe. Man, I love him. I love, I beat myself up because, you know, I get so moody with this world. I don't like being here. I don't like the direction it's going. I don't like, I don't like anything. I, I, I hate that the United States has such an uprising against good and, and, and sweet things that we used to embrace. Being put, listen, being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit made Jesus Christ alive. In other words, he was dead. They laid him in a tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus of Gamala, they wrapped up his body. They put him in a tomb. And when the time came, the Holy Spirit said, okay, it's time to get up. And he rose victorious. Don't you just love Jesus, man? What a, what a, what a, what a superhero, man. Jesus. Yeah, I think Superman's great. I think Batman's great. I think Jesus. <laughs> Puts an end to everything. Not that Superman and Batman are real. I, I know. Okay. <laughs> By whom, listen, he went and preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly disobedient when the once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. while the ark was being prepared. Now, up until this point, you go, oh, this is easy, no big deal. Then you get to that verse and you go, huh? All right, so we're talking about the ark. Okay, well, where do we know about the ark? Well, the ark was something that had to be invented because God was going to bring judgment on the world. If I were God, I would have done it that day. But God says, I'm not going to put up with this much longer. 120 years is what you get. 120 years? Yeah, God is fair, man. 120 years. Go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, okay? Genesis chapter 6. For those of you that are not into this, you can go to sleep. You have our permission. Now all of a sudden we have chapter 6, now it came to pass. 
So some time has gone on. You know, scholars tell us Adam, Eve, it's about 4,004 before Christ. 4,004 years before Christ. As a matter of fact, that's like kind of where the Jewish calendar starts. Came to pass. We're not exactly sure what year this was, but we think, not we, them, I read it. We think this is somewhere around 3800 BC. Not long after Adam and Eve. Not long uh, after Cain and, and Abel and Seth. Things moved quickly. Things were progressing quickly. And it says, and now it came to pass. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth. So that's early on, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And daughters were born to them. Well, naturally. That the sons, and that word is a key, the word sons, it's bene Elohim, the sons of God, angels. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men, fathers, those are our daughters, daughters of men. In particular, we can trace this back to Mesopotamia. Women in an area of Mesopotamia that really adorned themselves and, you know, took Egyptian uh, custom and putting on heavy makeup. And, and the angels looked on and went, yo, these daughters of men aren't like the other ones. I like these. Yeah, like prostitutes. And that's what they looked on at. Now listen, they saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives. The Hebrew word there means by force. Um, now, we don't know if that was an aggression or took them by force because of the way they looked. Remember, they're angels. And they can make themselves look as good or as evil as they want. They're angels. And in this case, we'd have to say that they made themselves look beautiful. You know, the Fabio kind of stuff, you ladies, if you want to understand this. You know, I don't know if they're riding horses or not, but uh, Fabio. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, now remember, the background, one third of the angels fell with Lucifer. But remember, he fell in a spiritual sense. Lucifer still had access to heaven. I don't understand that. Boot them out, lock the door to heaven. But God doesn't do that. God still allows him to have access and the demons to have access. In fact, and I really don't have time to go there this morning, but read the book of Job. And, and Job is in the presence of God. Why didn't God just... Sh sh Job's in the presence. Well, he was, but Lucifer is in the presence of God. Why didn't he just strike him dead? These are things that we can't possibly comprehend. The long-suffering of God. But Satan is going to play out a role in God, in God's plan. And God says, oh yeah, you've been roaming the earth, huh? Looking around? Yeah, kind of boring. You keep putting your mark on everybody. I can't touch anybody is the understanding there. And he goes, all right, have you considered my servant Job? And what we don't have in writing, but you can hear Satan's voice in the whole thing saying, yeah, I consider Job. And you got the biggest hedge of protection around that guy. You won't let me touch him. You won't let me hurt him. If the day you let me hurt him, he will curse you to your face. And God says, all right, do what you want. But you can't touch him. You can't take his life. And you guys know the story. I think you know the story. Job loses everything. His children die. All of his cattle, his feed, all the people that worked for him, everybody's dead. Except his wife. His wife was alive. <laughs> you 
And what does she say? Curse God and die! We don't have a verse in that book that says God take her too, but you can imagine that's how he felt. So we get a little insight that God had to allow that. And Peter says, well, what's the big deal if you suffer a little bit for doing God's will? Because we don't know what the backdrop is. And anybody who's gone through incredible persecution, has lost life, lost loved ones. Listen, Job is a comfort. God sees this. God knows this. God's going to restore life. That's a comfort, man. And he gives us that in, in his scripture that we can hang on to. For those of us that haven't gone through that, you look at that book and you go, dude, I want nothing to do with this. And rightfully so. But we get some of this insight. So now, so what happens here? He says, man, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. In other words, worthless. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now you had men that were alive 1,200 years, 900 years, 1,000 years. Why? We were supposed to live forever. We were supposed to live forever. But now God says, look, I'm going to shorten it to 120 years. And if you know your Bible, you know that it took Noah a preacher of righteousness, 120 years to build the ark. What was God doing? He was allowing the preacher to preach. Noah's there building an ark. There's evil in the land. What kind of evil? Well, well, this kind of evil. There were giants on the earth in those days. And this is a key phrase. And also afterward. After what? After the judgment. What judgment? A flood. A flood. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Men of renown? And if you start following that out, Greek mythology. Greek mythology. Um, how do you have all of these stories uh, of Achilles and all, all these stories of Men that could do incredible things. Listen, the offspring, the offspring, the offspring, the offspring, to the offspring, to the point where it gets, now you have these men who have DNA in them of fallen angels. And they can do incredible work. Now, let's back up a little bit. Let's go back here. These were the men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and then that every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth. That's not the kind of sorry that you and I would have. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I've made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why? Noah didn't partake of this evil. Noah lived a righteous life with his family. In the streets, we had giants. You got nine foot, 10 foot, 11 foot giants running around. Half breeds. Half breeds. Why? Fallen angels. One third of the angels fell. Now, not all of them had relations with human women. But many did. What we don't have, we, we have some, some cryptic verses that I don't have time to get into. That book, Doctrine of Endless Punishment, we'll get into it. At some point, God takes those fallen angels and locks them in a place called Tartarus, where they can never, ever escape from until he says so. That day hasn't come yet, by the way, thankfully. Thankfully. Fallen angels locked up, but they have offspring. Their offspring, we understand, take on the title of Nephilim. This is a special class of half-breeds. They have no soul. 
They cannot be redeemed. They're not human. But they're like freaks. Again, nine foot, 10 foot, 11 foot. They're angry. They're aggressive. There's bloodshed everywhere. People are dying everywhere. And God looks on us and says, nobody's safe. They're taking life. There's fighting within each other. And these have to be exterminated. And God chooses to do that with a flood, a cleansing flood. He says, I'm only going to contend with man for 120 years. Noah's building an ark. It takes him 120 years to complete. Every day, hammering away on this ark. His sons, the daughters, everybody's working. People in the town. Hey, uh, Noah, what is this contraption? Uh, it's, it's an ark. A what? Did he say a park? No, I think he said an ark. What's it for? Well, well God told me to build it because God's going to pour down water from the skies. Wait, you believe in God? Okay, and your God's going to do what? He's going to pour down water from the sky. The water, he's going to pour it from the sky, and we're all going to drown. Okay, <laughs> this guy's out of his mind. Hey, did you go see Noah? Come on, let's go down, let's go make fun of him. Let's throw rocks at him while he's out on the outside of that ark. Now listen. Noah builds this ark. Chapter 7 tells us, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and your household, because I've seen you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven of each of every clean animal. And God prepares. Now listen, verse 6. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth Noah and his sons his wife daughters-in-laws they went into the ark and then became the waters of the flood and it rains for 40 days now remember if as you read this passage it says that Noah went into the ark and God closed them in God closed them in. God protected them from all the evil that was in the world. It's a picture of rapture. Peter's going to draw another conclusion from this, saying, hey, this is a lot like baptism. They went down into the water, but they rose up, and they were saved. God saved them. God spared them. On the outside, we have this group called Nephilim. God wants them dead. Now listen, here's what we have to understand. The Nephilim, a special group, and their offspring that did not survive the flood, they drowned, were disembodied. Fallen angels locked away. Fallen angels are not walking around today. Fallen angels aren't doing evil in the world. Fallen angels are locked away. Some of you have books that say, uh, well, there's fallen angels that are causing all kinds of disruption. Not true. Not true. Fallen angels aren't doing anything. They're awaiting judgment. The offspring of this Nephilim disembodied. The Nephilim themselves drowning. God not allowing them to live. But the spirit of the angel that was in them was then released, becoming demonic in nature, a demon. A demon now in, on the earth with nowhere to go. And that's why every time we see a demon, they want to inhabit. They want to take a life. They want to be in some kind of life. Have you come before the time of judgment? We just talked about this. I can't tell you when, but recently. Have you come to judge us, to throw us, listen, into the abuso? Please, allow us to go into those pigs. Why? Because it wasn't the time for the abuso. 
That's coming. Revelation. It's coming. But for now, puts him in the pigs. The pigs feeling this demonic presence don't even want to live. They go and commit, yeah, you know, suicide. And, and now, the, now these demons need another body. And it says and they, they, they go into arid places seeking a body that they can inhabit. Oh, no. What if it's me? If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, it can't be you. Amen? Can't be you. Can't be you. Not one time in Scripture do we ever see, ever see, a saved person have a demon. Once free, right, is free indeed. You're free indeed. There's a warning. It says if you return to your ways, if you go back to the old lifestyle, it says, man, that demon returns and he finds that house cleaned out. Then he goes and grabs seven more demons to come with him. And then it says your condition's even worse after the fact. And listen, gang, and I'll tell you that that is true, and I've lived it out myself. I've seen that that's true. And, and, and God is good to, to free. And that's why we can always run back to the foot of the cross and ask for blessing. So fallen angels and demons are two different groups. Now, and there's a lot that we can talk about. These Mesopotamian women... This group that had these offspring, it says that in that day, and again, this is a key verse, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. So there were offspring, not of Nephilim, uh, not directly, but there were other groups of giants. The Bible tells us that there were 60 mentioned cities of the giants. And, you know, we have the Rephaim, um, we have the uh, Anakites, um, they said some of the Amalekites were of that uh, group, uh, uh, Gath, we know Goliath, Goliath is probably a sixth or seventh generation removed from Nephilim to this, this giant living in Gath, and many of those that were in Gath were giants. How did they survive the flood? We don't know. No, 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 Pastor Mike. I read in my Bible that everything was dead on the earth except Noah and his family. Yes, everything that had a soul that could be redeemed was redeemed on that ark. But there were things on this earth that were not redeemable that still lived. Giants. Uh, Amalek. Um, we, have a whole, we have a whole list now, God says, oh, man, I, gotta, I can't touch that today. Wow, we're out of time. Are you kidding me? I'm going to read this from the, oh, man. I'm going to read this from, from one Enoch. Enoch, a righteous man, God took him home. We're not even sure how. He just was, and then he wasn't. But a righteous man and a preacher of righteousness in his own. It said, In those days when the children of men had multiplied, it happened that there was born to them handsome and beautiful daughters. And the angels and the children of heaven saw them and desired them. They said to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves among the daughters of men. Let us beget children. And they took the wives unto themselves, and, and everyone chose a woman for himself. And they began to go unto them. Now listen, Then Michael the archangel, Surafel, and Gabriel, all angels, observed carefully from the sky, and they saw much blood being shed upon the earth and all the oppression being wrought upon the earth. As for the women, they gave birth to giants to the degree that the whole earth was filled with blood and oppression. And now behold, the Holy One will cry, and those who have died will bring up uh, their suit to the gate of heaven. Their groaning has ascended into heaven, but they could not get out from before the face 
of the oppression that is being wrought on earth. And Gabriel said, Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of adultery and destroy the children of adultery and expel the children of the watchers. That would be that first generation of Nephilim, also known as the watchers, from among the people and send them against one another so that they might be destroyed in the fight for the length of days they have not. And when they have had their children and they have battled with each other, and when they've had seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for 70 generations underneath the rocks of the ground until the day of the judgment and their cons uh, consummation, until eternal judgment is concluded. Now this is currently... Well, he's telling us seven, 70 generations. This is currently the Hebrew year of 5782. If this took place in 3800, and this clock starts at 4004 BC, guess what? We are within just a few years of this Bible timeline, of these demons being released. We know through Revelation that God says he releases this abuso, this bottomless pit, Uh, during that time. And I'm glad that we are out of here uh, for that. Turn with me to Luke chapter 16. We'll bring it to a close here. I, I'm sorry that it's taken so long to get this all out, but I want to teach this correctly. So we're going to run just a little long today, but I promise you'll get something out of it and you'll see something from it. Luke chapter 16, we'll pick it up in the 19th verse. We get a little insight. They call this the parable of, of the rich man. Not so. Not a parable at all. This had to be a true story. Why? Because we have people mentioned by name and God never does that in a parable. He mentions this man by name. Not the rich man, but the poor man, Lazarus. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, that means he was very wealthy, and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and they licked his sores. So it was when the beggar died. He was carried by the angels, very comforting, to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom or in the care of Abraham. Then he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said to him, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus, man, evil things. But now he's comforted, and, and you're tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, man, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here cannot, and, and nor can you, or nor can those from there pass to us. And he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, five, five brothers, that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from, from them to the dead or from the dead, they'll repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, in other words, if they don't listen to the Old Testament, neither will they be persuaded the one should rise from the dead. What's happening here? We get an insight. Jesus gives us some insight to what hell looks like. And we use the term Hades very, very loosely. But understand, there are many, many terms for hell, and it's not the same place. Sheol is not the same place. Gehenna is not the same place. Hades is a place of waiting for the wicked. Then you had this place called paradise. The rich man was in Hades. The poor man, the beggar, was in paradise. Now, 
Matthew. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after this, the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What? Here's what happened. It says, it says in Peter, and we can turn there. You can leave that on the screen. Go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll read again what happened. He was raised by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the saints in prison. Many of you have books that says that Jesus Christ, upon his death, resurrected. He went down into hell and said, see, I told you I was telling the truth. And he preached to those in hell. to convince them to give their lives to the Lord, that he preached the gospel. <laughs> Nonsense. It's not what it says. Not what it says. Listen, you want to know what it says? Here's what it says. It says that he went and he preached. The word is caruso. He proclaimed. He proclaimed. Yeah, he proclaimed. What did he proclaim? Listen. He proclaimed to the spirits that are in prison. The word prison is the word Tartarus. It's only used one time, and it's used by Peter. It's the word Tartarus. It's a special prison. And I don't know the layout because I haven't been there. Don't plan to go. There's Hades. There's Paradise. We have Gehenna. All on some kind of a a very lateral plane, and because it's a bottomless pit means it has to be somehow in the center of the earth or in the center of something because every way is up. Okay? Bear with me. We also have, again, a Hades, and then we have this place called Tartarus. What this is telling us is that Jesus rose from the dead. Somehow, after seeing Mary, don't touch me because I haven't yet ascended to the Father, it's sometime after this that now Jesus is in a glorified body, that he descends to this place called Tartarus. And what does he do? He proclaims. What does he proclaim? He doesn't proclaim to those that are there saying, hey, would you now repent of your sin? No, no, you're dead. There's nothing bringing you back from that. You're done. You had your choice. You chose not to follow the prophets. You chose not to, to follow what Moses told you. You're done. We're not talking about this anymore. What does he do? Jesus turns his attention to those spirits, fallen angels. Now that he's glorified and they see exactly who he is, and he puts them on notice. Why did they do what they did? Convinced by Satan to destroy the human gene pool so that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, could not be born. They tried to break the line. Let's have, you know, immoral people that have no soul, that can't be redeemed. We'll, we'll do it all through the Jewish people. Jesus Christ can't come through that line, and we'll have victory in hell. Jesus descends to hell and goes, how you doing? Where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? Hell, where's your victory? What do you got? He puts them on notice. That's what Jesus Christ does when he goes to hell. And he tells those fallen angels, you will never have power over my people. You will never have power over the Christians. We live forever and you will be banished and you're staying here until I say so. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Why? He's, all, he's got all authority. He did that. Listen, he did that for you. He put them on notice so that you would take notice. You've got nothing to be afraid of. There is no power in this world that can really affect you. Can't touch you. And it's amazing. And we'll talk about this a little bit next week. There's nothing, listen, nothing in this world, seen or unseen, 
that can never touch or stand. That's why he says, who can harm you? Who can harm you? Nobody. Nothing. Not even, not even those in Tartarus. Now, the graves that broke open that Matthew tells us about, I want to have a conversation with him why he did this. But what happened? Those that were in paradise. They were with paradise. There is no paradise now, right? Right? Amen? Yeah. It says paradise is now with God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Before Jesus arose, that was not possible. You stayed in paradise. You're just kind of hanging out waiting. That's kind of nice here, but I think there's got to be something better. Don't you think there's something better? And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Hey, I'll be right with you guys. I'm going to address them. Boom! Come on, guys, let's go. And then all of a sudden, the graves break open. And, and people that were dead are now walking around going, oh, Jerusalem's kind of nice. It's pretty nice around here. Kind of like it. I like it. Oh, earthquake, really? We tore that temple, huh? Hey, guys, it's time to go. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now they're ushered out of here and into the presence of God. Okay? Demons? Demons have not been dealt with yet. Demons are still on this earth, still on this planet. Some, by ranking, stronger than others. You can invite them into your life if you'd like. <laughs> Who wants to invite a demon into their lives? Those of you that love to argue with your wives or your husbands. Let me tell you something. We can so easily invite spirits of darkness into our homes. Sometimes it's by inviting somebody in that doesn't belong there. You know they don't belong there. They don't believe like you believe. They don't think like you think. But you have them at your house and you break bread with them. And it's not to win them to Christ. You just like them. And on them, they carry these demonic spirits. And listen, they're very, very real, gang. Today we medicate people that have demons. And what they need to be done is exercised. Listen, I ran into one yesterday. I ran into a guy that was, he was demonically possessed in an auto parts store of all places. Man, they're everywhere. And they'll say, oh, we're just going to send them over to an institution. They'll give them some medication. And... That's not the answer. How about we lay hands on people and cast out demons? Why? Well, because apparently we can still do that. People still need to be freed. Oh, oh this one over here, he's bipolar. We throw bipolar on everything. Guy's in a bad mood, he's bipolar. How about he's got a demon and he doesn't have to die to it? How about he's getting involved in stuff he shouldn't be getting involved in? Why don't we go to their rooms and see all the demonic posters they have hanging in their rooms? Let's listen to the music that they're listening to. Let's see the stuff that's coming into their lives before we just say, oh, they have a chemical reaction or an imbalance and they need medication. How about it's possible that they've given themselves over to demons? that were very much real in the beginning at the flood, very much real in Jesus' day. Jesus didn't say, well, I just think that you need a little Prozac. No, he said, get out! And they were gone because they feared him. And if the, listen, if the presence and the power of the living God is in you and it's in me, why can't we do the same? Why can't we do the same? Oh, ye of little faith, Listen, you are much stronger than you give yourself credit for. And you have a whole lot more Holy Spirit than you want to admit. But the day that we lock in, Lord, use my life, and you start laying hands on people, you'll be amazed at what God can do through your life. Now, we're, we're about halfway done with this topic, okay? So we're going to come back and we'll, we'll, we'll want to finish up. And we'll describe a little bit. We're going we're to talk about Gehenna. What is Gehenna? We're going to look at Revelations, look at this. And we're going to see what actually happens to these demons and these angels. So thank you for hanging in there so far with me. Okay, this is part one of two parts. I think two parts. And, uh, and we'll, we'll extinguish this topic. And then we'll move on and we'll live happily ever after. Amen? Amen. Worship team, come on up. Let's all stand to our feet. We got taquitos waiting. Thank you for watching from home or wherever you're at. God bless you. We love you. It's much nicer here on this side than watching it on a tube. But we love you. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.